insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 49, Rebranding, Rumors, and Baby Yoda. Yay, Baby Yoda. I'm your host, (laughs) Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and entertaining co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetie? I'm good, and you? Doing all right. Uh, so we are filming again, a little off schedule. Uh, this is yeah. actually <laughs> Sunday. Uh, we had uh, three podcasts that we've done so far this weekend, and just the schedule wasn't working out. Right. So we are <clears throat> diligently trying to get this moved to a Thursday schedule, and <laughs> at some failing point in time. miserably <laughs> in that. We we probably shouldn't <clears throat> even just try. Just do it whenever we feel like it yeah. at this point, and. You know, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll, get, we'll there. get there at some point. So in today's Disney detective, we're going to be talking about uh, Disney rebranding their 20th Century Fox Studios. Then we will talk about uh, John Favreau, uh, a.k.a. the see, showrunner for Mandalorian. I think so. I think that's, <clears throat> I think that's his title. His title. Uh, sharing a uh, cute little photo of uh, George Lucas uh, cradling baby Yoda uh, and the impact of that. And uh, we'll talk about what we had discussed earlier regarding mm-hmm. that as well. Then we'll talk about rumors of a new Vader series starring Hayden Christensen and James Earl Jones. That was a terrible impersonation. That was, yeah, that was yeah, really bad. Sorry. Yeah. In our entertainment news, we will look at uh, AMC and Regal uh, not screening Netflix uh, Oscar nominees, which I think is kind of interesting. And then we'll look at uh, Patrick Stewart making his mark in Hollywood outside the Chinese theater. So, interesting show today. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we ready to get into it? Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So, obviously, uh, last March, Walt Disney, the Walt Disney Company, had uh, bought 20th Century Fox. Um, and now they're finally starting to transition some name changes, I guess you could say. Uh, so, they're actually dropping Fox from the brand um, of the 21st Century Fox assets. Um, Variety actually had this article. So the 20th Century Fox Studio will now be known as the 20th Century Studio. And then Fox Searchlight Pictures will simply become Searchlight Pictures. Uh, On the TV side of things, nothing has actually um, been finalized with that. So right now it's 20th Century Fox Television and Fox 21 uh, television studios. So I'm guessing at some point that's probably uh, going to change over. Uh, they've even started changing over, um, phasing out the Fox name in email addresses. Uh, and, you know, like Fox.com uh, has kind of changed over or been replaced with searchlightpictures.com. Um, even some of the newer movie posters that have been coming out. Um, there's a, a new movie uh, that's under the Searchlight um, <clears throat> brand that basically just says Searchlight Pictures Presents. Um, also, they're starting to change up a little bit of the logo um, as well. Um, so Disney had acquired them for $71.3 billion last March. Um, 
So, you know, it was only a matter of time before some changes were going to happen. Um, and this was kind of interesting. The original 20th Century Fox was actually formed in a merger in 1935 between 20th Century Pictures and Fox Film Corporation. Um, the company's Art Deco searchlight logo uh, and theme song kind of became, you know, a very iconic Hollywood brand. Um, and, you know, they released you know, some of the very successful Hollywood movies, including Avatar, Titanic, Home Alone, Die Hard, Star Wars, A New Hope, uh, and Planet of the Apes. Um, and Rupert, uh, Rupert Murdoch had actually bought them in the mid eighties. Um, and along with the television, you know, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's obviously gone through its morphs, you know, over the years, you know, but Fox was always kind of you know, part of it, and now Disney is saying, "Bye, Fox." Yeah, it's kind of sad to see that that movie tradition go. I mm-hmm. mean, it 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 kind of I don't know from a nostalgic standpoint, it kind of hurt when you didn't get the 20th century fanfare right. at the beginning of a Star Wars movie anymore. Right, 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 because uh, that was so iconic. Right. I am curious though why they're dropping because, as far as I understand, in the deal, the acquisition deal. They own the rights, the naming mm-hmm. rights and everything. Right, right. So there's really, and they're not Disney branding it either. No, no. So they're basically throwing out a brand that's been around for over 100 years now, yeah, almost yeah, 100 years yeah. now, and coming up with their own. And I, I I'm guess I'm, from a business standpoint, I'm, I'm scratching my head as to what the impetus for that is. Yeah, I have no idea. But, you know, obviously... You know, it's just basically the word Fox is being, you know, taken out for some strange reason, you know, yeah. where, like you said, nothing else is really changing with any of the... Uh, yeah, that's not... I don't know why so. they would have capitalized on the the naming. I mean, you 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 didn't just buy the property. You didn't, right. You didn't buy the intellectual property. You bought the name. Right, right. To just throw it out. It just seems... It would have been, would have been like, you know, buying Lucasfilm and throwing the Lucas name away. It right, just, it right. It didn't make... Doesn't make much sense, but that's Disney. They can do what they want with their money. They can. So what else do we have on the docket? Uh, So John Favreau shared a very adorable Star Wars photo of George Lucas cradling Baby Yoda. If you haven't seen it, it's it's the cutest little thing. Um, It 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 was just kind of kind of sweet, like aw, Grandpa. (laughs) <laughs> type type thing. Um, so the first season of Disney Plus's Mandalorian might be in the books, but the mania and love fest is obviously still continuing. Um, so the other day, um, John Favreau tweeted and posted this photo on Instagram, and you know, basically everybody went went crazy, you know, for the photo. Um, uh, so in an article, Favreau had actually said the one thing uh, when he talked about, you know, talking with, with George Lucas, uh, he said the one thing he said to me, remember, John, the real audience for all stories and all myths is the kids that are coming of age because he's really a Joseph Campbell adherent. Um, we enjoy these stories as adults, but really storytelling is about imparting the wisdom of the previous generations onto the children who are becoming adults and giving them a context for how to behave and how to learn the lessons of the past without making mistakes on their own. So that was kind of an interesting uh quote from him um it's not clear uh basically because there was no caption of the photo whether or not this was a new photo or an old photo was this from you know the filming of season two was this from you know the beginning of season one um but again everybody you know kind of went you know crazy for it um and on a related note, which is something else that we were going to bring up, which we didn't have the article here, um, but obviously everybody's been looking for Baby Yoda toys, Ooh, you know, and you haven't really been able to to find anything. Um, it was announced earlier this week that Build-A-Bear Workshop was going to be um, 
finally doing baby custom uh, custom baby Yoda dolls. So of course that's probably going to be you know crazy once right. once they drop. <clears throat> um, but Out an the article, door and, right? You know, waiting line and everything. <laughs> right, like they were doing with the you know pay how much your your kid is. Right, your uh, age. that fiasco yeah. uh, thing. Um, but. The other thing that we were actually just talking about right before we we came uh, to to film was that there was an article that you found where Disney was now cracking down on Etsy, right? Because that's where a lot of people are going to to find. <clears throat> yeah, know, I mean, when I went to get when I tried to find you know the Baby Yoda merchandise to get for you, the only place that I could really find it was Etsy, and and there were all different. Uh, vendors on there that were right. selling them crocheted or 3D printed or or what have you, and uh, you got different quality, you got you know different styles, um, but it was all over the place. Right now, Disney obviously has not come out with theirs yet. Their stuff is on pre order. Mm -hmm. March, April is the time frame that their merchandise is coming out. Their right, official merchandise. Right, and there was this huge glut of people who wanted merchandise. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people turn to Etsy to get that. Mm -hmm, yeah. And for us, it worked out well. I mean, mm -hmm. to the point that it yielded us a travel blog for Baby Yoda, too, <laughs> for our vacation. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, Disney is now flexing their strong arm muscle and shutting it down, which I think is certainly legally within their rights. Mm -hmm. But from a from a a fan standpoint, I think it's pretty 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 bad right know? and the thing is you know anybody like even though i have my two little baby yodas you know once official merchandise comes out right i'm it's, gonna go spend more money it's not like know? etsy's taking money out right. of disney's pocket right etsy was filling a gap that right. disney right. artificially created right in their reasoning of not wanting to release details plot details right which totally get because if you know, I'm sure the, you know, suspense behind that first scene of the first episode, if we had already, oh, absolutely. you know, saw toys, yeah. we would have been like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, that, right. you know, it totally would have ruined it. So I could totally see well, not wanting and to honestly, do that. Honestly, the problem at that point in time is, is not that you shouldn't have the stuff ahead of time. It's the people that you're partnering with, if they're unable to keep trade secrets, then you need to find new partners. Right, right. Because you have companies like Apple who mm -hmm. can who can maintain that secrecy through their partner channels. Right. You know, if Disney doesn't have that kind of relationship with their manufacturing partners, they need to find new partners at mm -hmm. that point. Yeah. That's not an excuse to not release the product. Right. And Christmas time would have been... Plenty of time. Yeah, I mean, you to, completely you know. missed because mm -hmm. you wrapped up the entire season of Mandalorian before Christmas even hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that you didn't have a single product other than a T-shirt or a mug that you could have that they could print readily. Right. You know that's inexcusable. That's almost yeah. as bad as they did when when the first Frozen came right. out and and Etsy filled that gap too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, if anything, Disney needs to understand that Etsy's not stealing money from them. Etsy's Getting people to want that product mm -hmm. more, and they're filling that gap yeah. until Disney can produce it. Yep. So the fact that they're cracking down on I think is really unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take a step back real quick and talk about <clears throat> the reasoning that um, that Lucas gave to Favreau about, you know, we're making these for the next generation. Mm -hmm. We're making these for the kids. Right. And, you know, I'm not – you all know – as well as anyone, that I'm not a huge fan of the last two Star Wars movies that came out. Really? And I don't want to get into it, <laughs> but... Because that's a whole separate podcast. I will say that if the movies themselves were made in the tradition that Lucas had and that you're making it for the kids, I think they hit it on the mark because you... The kids, all the kids loved it, you know? Mm -hmm. Everyone that I talked to who has kids that took it took them to see it. Mm -hmm. If you were under a certain age, you loved both of those movies. Maddie did. And uh, she's, exactly, you know. Exactly. And I think that really is the watermark there. So I'm not, that's kind of why I'm not as upset about it. Mm -hmm. um, there were things that were in the movies that were made for people my age mm -hmm. and it just wasn't, it was done poorly. Mm. 
And I think those are the things that I get hung up on right. more than anything. Well, and I wonder now if you saw A New Hope as you now, not the four-year-old right. that saw it, would you still be as... Oh, no, it would still be awesome. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know yeah, how... Because it had everything. And it was made... See, the, the, that's the thing. A New Hope was not made to be part of a series. It was made to be a standalone movie. True. And it works very well as a standalone yeah, movie. Yeah, it does. You have yeah. a beginning, you have a middle, you have an end, and it sums the whole thing up. Right. Your characters are so well established. Like, this whole idea of having to go back and do backstories. Mm. You know, I think it's a really bad idea. Because when Darth Vader walks through that door on the Tantive for the first time... You don't need his backstory. You don't need to know where he came from. Right. That scene itself establishes itself. Right. No, I get it. Han Solo at the cantina. Mm -hmm. That the discussion he has with uh, Ben and Luke, you get that cocky, surefire attitude. Mm -hmm. When he, and he does shoot first, when he shoots first and kills Greedo, Basically, in cold blood, that establishes that character. I don't need a solo standalone movie right, to establish right, it. And all yeah. they do is ruin it with that. Mm -hmm. So the character development that occurs in that movie, yes, the plot itself is black and white. Mm -hmm. Good versus evil. You can't get any simpler than no, that. No, no, true. But the character development that you see, you leave that movie knowing that Han and Chewie have been together for years and they're best friends and they'll die for each other. Mm. You know, Luke is the farm boy, innocent guy who sees the world in black and white and he's the perfect guy to be in that role. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben is that aged wizard who comes along and tries to guide you. I mean, they're, they're prototypical roles mm. that are just so well done in the first movie because Lucas didn't think he had anything after that. You don't start getting into the more complicated. That's why Empire, I think, you know, is a lot of people's favorites because it breathed new life into it. And it was like, okay, so we're going to have something more out of this. We need to get a little, little bit deeper. Okay. And you see the depths start to come out there. And then by the time you get to Return of the Jedi, they get to the point where, okay, this is really is for kids. So we need to put some kid elements in there because let's face it, Empire was pretty dark. Yeah. So when you get to Return of the Jedi and Lucas is, trying, right, Lucas is trying to focus it back for an, an audience of children, mm -hmm. you get the, the little teddy bears that are in there and the good guys have to win and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it from that perspective, targeting the kids for the prequel trilogy, I hated the prequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't need to know the backstory of Darth Vader. You ruined Darth Vader for me because he's this whiny little kid at this point in time. Now you know where his son gets it from. Exactly. Yeah. But it was made for the kids. Right. So goofy characters like Jar Jar make sense at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense at all in the in the whole grand scheme if you're looking at it from a critically acclaimed right. perspective. But from the kids' perspective, you kind of needed that. Um, so I'm kind of attributing this philosophy that Lucas expresses here mm -hmm. to Favreau as the the reason for where the trilogy where the latest trilogy wound up going. And I'm accepting the trilogy based strictly on the fact that it was made for the kids and the kids have universally loved it. So that's where my acceptance is and, and I'll get off the uh, the soapbox. Okay. In time to talk about some rumors. <laughs> So, in case you haven't had enough Star Wars, hmm. <laughs> we're going to have to have a Star Wars segment moving forward. Yeah, at this point, it, it really, you know, and I had like a whole bunch of other Star Wars topics, and I was thinking, I'm like, well, wait, it's basically just Star Wars stuff. Um, so, a new rumor has surfaced that could make some Star Wars fans very happy and others not so happy and a bunch of people that are kind of in the middle that just really don't care. So a report that came from, we got this covered. There is a very, 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 very early talks of a possible series centered around the galaxy's greatest dad, Darth Vader. Not me. 
<laughs> I'm so disappointed. I know. Uh, the idea would reportedly feature James Earl Jones voicing the Dark Lord of the Sith, with Hayden Christensen returning in the role of Anakin Skywalker in flashback sequences. Uh, the story would take place between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, and would fill audience in audiences in on how vader went from the broke it <laughs> broke ass robot assistant to the most feared agent of the empire um so obviously if you're not an obsessed fan you might be kind of you know like well wait a second you know the prequels like you said were were kind of bad and and whatnot um, but it seems that there are some people that feel that hayden christensen even though in the prequels was kind of very whiny and not so good they're they're thinking that you know he really is a decent actor that it was just he was you scripted know, bad it was the, it was really I mean, look the at script. natalie portman oh, natalie yeah. portman's a fantastic actress and she right. got stuck with this stinker of a script right. and this dialogue that she was and stuck that if with. you actually had you know a better script and some better directors that this Just could the actually dialogue. all they had to do was rewrite yeah. Lucas's dialogue because he can't write dialogue to save his life. Right. Um, you know, so that obviously, you know, your most favorite Darth Vader scene is Rogue One. Um, you know, so that, you know, everybody that saw hit, you know, Vader show up in Rogue One was like, oh my God, that's the Vader, mm -hmm. you know, we want to to see. And so just to be specific, it's the end scene with Vader. Not right. the goofy scene with in the middle there where right. he's cracking jokes and stuff like that. That is not the Vader I want to see. Right. You want to see the last five minute Vader. Right. And... Vader is not supposed to have a sense of humor. <laughs> no, he's no. not. No. Um, he's so... not doing stand up <laughs> at the cantina. <laughs> Thursday nights, two drink minimum, with right? The, with the band playing back <laughs> with up With the for band him. playing um, back up. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of backstory, you know, to this um, for people that have, you know, read the comics and read the books, you know, so there's plenty of, of information to kind of see, you know, um, you know, uh, where the storyline would go. So, you know, he builds his castle in order to harness, you know, basically enough power to be able to bring Padme back to life. Um, you know, when he fails with that, he kind of goes on a hunt and starts, you know, eliminating, you know, the remaining Jedis with the Fallen Order and the Sith Inquisitors. So, you know, this is stuff you know, obviously, because I know you've read all the books and pretty much all the comics, you know, that have been related to Darth Vader. So this would be kind of interesting for the people who, you know, are fans of Darth Vader, but just never got into the books or comics to kind of see where that badass Vader, you right. know, came from. Um, so again, still very, very early, you know, rumors, um, but between, you know, getting the Obi-Wan, uh, show on um on disney plus and the other couple of star wars series that are, are going to be coming out who knows maybe you know this will be one that actually does come uh, to fruition well see and and the thing is the one thing that i criticize disney about with their star wars is this latest trilogy you get dropped in the middle of a story mm -hmm. you have no idea like you know where it ended in, in return of the jedi so then you're 30, 35 years later, you get dropped in the middle of the story. You have no idea who the First Order is, where it came from. You have no idea what the resistance is. Right. You have no idea why Leia's a general all of a sudden and right. not a princess. Any so you know none of this. Right. And Disney tries to fill the blanks in between the books and the comics mm -hmm. to get you to that point. Right. And they do a miserably terrible job of that because mm – -hmm. 5% of the population is going to read that material. Right, right. And even the material they release didn't really fill in those blanks. Right. So on one hand, I like the idea of having the backstory done in television shows. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff they're doing in The Mandalorian could feed into that. Mm -hmm. The stuff that they're doing with Obi-Wan feed. But, but I don't need the backstory that leads into A New Hope. Mm-hmm. I need the backstory that leads into Force Awakens mm. because I kind of was able, you know, people were able to figure out, like I said, you know, your characters are established. You know right. in that first scene who Darth Vader is and what he's all about. Right, right. 
So you don't need those backstories. And all you're going to do is ruin the characters with additional backstories on there. What I need to know is, you know, how did the First Order arise out of the Empire? Mm -hmm. So give me... Give me the stories for that. Give me those TV series that lead me into Force Awakens so that the new trilogy makes sense and I can buy into that new trilogy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, you know, coming out with it after the, the new trilogy is out makes sense so you're not ruining any, any plot spoilers or anything like mm. that. So I'm okay with the side stories there, but I'm not okay with it for the time period they're talking about. Mandalorian's ideal because you're dealing with the fringe. You're not you're not dealing with characters that have an impact on the main story. Mm -hmm. So you can see, for instance, what the remnants of the Empire are after Return of the Jedi. So you get a glimpse of that. Right, right. But you don't have him interacting with like main characters. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he Luke Skywalker's probably not going to appear in the Mandalorian. You gotta come to terms with that. Right, right. But you're seeing what that effect of everything that happened in Return of the Jedi is mm -hmm. on the overall Rest story. Rest of the world. Right, exactly. And that sort of thing works. But when you take a main character like Obi-Wan and you go and show, well, what happened between Revenge of the Sith and Return of the, and uh, New Hope? Well, who cares? It doesn't matter. Because you, you know what the progression is there. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need to know that he was stuck out on the desert somewhere like that and how he got the stains on his shirt. And like, like, like I don't need those details cause it doesn't define the character, you know, mm -hmm. but so when, you'd be okay uh, with a, uh, a show or something that was that same time period, but just not the characters that we already know some, you know, insignificant character absolutely. to show what happened that for that time frame. So, yeah. so that's really more to of provide what more context right. of what's, okay. what's happening gotcha. in that time frame. you know, okay. not for specific character development, but if you're going to give me a Darth Vader series, you better do it right. That's all I got to say. <laughs> or else you're going to revolt. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think that was all we had for our Disney detective. Yep. All right, let's move on to our entertainment news of the week. Mm -hmm. Speaking of revolts, tell us about uh, <laughs> AMC and Regal. So AMC and Regal have decided that they will not be showing any of the Oscar-nominated films that are part of Netflix. So usually right before... Um, the Oscars come out or after the Oscar nominations come out, most movie theaters are, you know, around the country will actually play all of uh, the nominated films. But it seems that AMC and Regal have decided to back out. Um, Netflix received 24 Oscar nominations on Monday, the most of any studio and the highest level to date of, a, of the streaming giant. Uh, both chains said that they would not screen its movies. A spokesman... Um, for the a for AMC uh, confirmed that the company would not be showing Netflix nominated films and declined further comment. Regal had um, basically came out and said that they wouldn't include uh, they would not be showing any nominated films without uh, a standard theatrical release. Um, Netflix and Martin Scorsese, your most favorite person in the whole wide world. Um, that's he's he's under Bob Iger, by the way, uh, earned 10 <laughs> nods, including for Best Picture, Best Director and Cinematography. Uh, nine films representing the wide range of genres were given Best Picture nominations. Um, so we had Joker, which uh, led the field with 11 nominations. Uh, the Netflix drama Marriage Story also received several nominations, uh, including for its lead actors. Uh, so the boycott by AMC and Regal is the latest in a long-running feud with Netflix. Uh, the chain has objected to Netflix's strategy of releasing movies shortly before or at the same time that they're shown in the home because the theater typically prefers a 90-day window of um, to have it exclusive for 90 days. Uh, even with Netflix Hall of Nominations this year, cinemas have not wanted to cash in on the Oscar nominations for these films, even though they drive a bounce in attendance. Uh, neither AMC 
theaters nor Regal ex- uh, showed The Irishman before Monday's announcements of the 2020 uh, Oscar nominations by the Academy, uh, even though it had a four week limited theatrical run before its stream debuted. Instead, Netflix cobbled together a hodgepodge of independent movie houses to ensure its films were eligible. Uh, to compete for the best picture. And this was actually something when we started doing our podcast last year that came up because of the, we actually went through and talked about what the requirements were to be able to be nominated. And you had to, you know, be for so many weeks and and everything. And, and, you know, and and Steven Spielberg was a big, you know, uh, uh, person in opposition of it and you know feeling like it was taking away you know from from everything um so the irishman opened in november in select theaters in los angeles and new york um as the sprawling drama marked you know the high profile film debut it you know it didn't show up on netflix you know until later on um and then you know obviously it their their bet paid off because they actually you know they they did get the nomination and the movie was also a three and a half hour long film now for netflix that's fine because everybody can pause it and you know watch it in multiple sittings but if you wanted to actually see it in the theater you know that's bathroom break friendly (laughs) you didn't you know um and that you know um that it's been watched you know at the time you know 26.4 million people have have watched it you know on netflix um, you know, so, you know, despite the boycott, you know, obviously you got a lot of people, you know, watching the, the various things, um, you know, the marriage story has been on about a thousand screens and the Irishman has been on, you know, 2000 screens. So there are people that are going out to the theater and, and watching them, not necessarily just on Netflix. Um, and there's actually a theater in Hollywood that Netflix is actually in the process of trying to acquire. So that's kind of interesting to see, you know. We'll see. And that's the thing. You have to know how to play the game. Right. And, and Netflix that's, is and that's just what learning how to it. play the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think this is kind of silly. I think I think these theaters themselves are going to financially hurt themselves mm-hmm. on a principle that, it's they're not going to turn around, right? <clears throat> You're not going to see this reverse this trend reversal, right? You're seeing everything move to streaming services mm-hmm. with Disney, with um, uh, Apple TV. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going with a streaming service right. now, and the award shows, you know, they don't have a choice, right? You can't simply ignore it because the old school people, you know, don't like the idea of it, right? Right. Um, so. I don't know. You know, it's it's one of those things that you got to move with the times if you're going to stay. Right. Out. And and that's the thing is, you know, Netflix had, you know, ended up getting the most nominations out of any studio, you know. So obviously they're putting out quality content. It's not like they're putting out, you know, crap stuff. They, right. you know, they're they're right. putting out stuff that's, you know, And as long as they adhere to the rules that right. are set out by the ruling boards mm-hmm. then you've got nothing to complain right. about right you know and if they you know if anything i'd be surprised that you know they don't go back and modify their rules and say you know this has to be changed or you know but maybe they'll just well and what is, i'm waiting and, for know. is i'm waiting for the lawsuits for these movie production companies against these theaters for discriminating against them mm. because they released through Netflix. Right. Or Netflix suing them for, because you know what's going to happen. Right. You know, it's just a matter of time. I did want to quickly point out, you mentioned my, my best friend, Bob Iger. <laughs> um, Bob Iger did have a significant salary drop in 2019. Bob Iger's salary, because his salary is a base salary of $3 million plus all the various, various bonuses stock bonuses and, and right, stuff right. like that. So Bob Iger's salary in 2019 dropped $18 million, almost a 28% drop. How this man is going to survive <laughs> at this point without those $18 million is absolutely mind-boggling how, how he's going to survive now with this. One of the bonuses that he had gotten last year was a bonus to actually uh, stay – 
with the company past his intended retirement date. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Bob's Bob's on poor street now. He's going to be filing <laughs> for for food stamps soon. <laughs> He's going to be making mac and cheese and hot dogs. <laughs> Ra- ramen noodles all the way. Um, I I do hope that with that eighteen million dollars, that Disney will be smart enough to give some of that back to its employees, because Iger certainly didn't need yeah. it or deserve it. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, sorry, had to interject on that one. <laughs> See, and I was gonna put that story in, and I was like, Nah, I you didn't dropped his name, so I had to go look it up and talk about I, it. See, and I and I told you about it because I I had already seen that one earlier. But. So our, our last story today. Well, this this was very, very sweet. Um, So Patrick Stewart, the icon from Star Trek, has now left his mark in Hollywood um, with his hands and feet in cement in front of Hollywood's Chinese theater. Did he not pay a mob debt or something? (laughs) He said, I'm still not really believing any of it. Any moment now, someone is going to say, Patrick, Patrick, get up. You're dreaming again. The 79-year-old Shakespearean actor gained widespread fame as uh, he portrayed Captain Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation going back to 1987. Uh, The the series spawned four films and most recently, the most recent in uh, 2002. In addition to his Star Trek success, Stewart has obviously uh, done other various films and uh, was obviously very popular as uh, Professor Charles Xavier in the X-Men films. Uh, The honor actually comes uh, a few days before Star Trek Picard makes its streaming service debut on CBS All Access. His return to the Star Trek universe uh, begins on January 23rd with the show's latest incarn when the show's latest incarnation debuts Uh, and the series has has already been renewed for a second season and hasn't even um, come out yet. Uh, the new series will s- feature some cast members from the original Star Trek The Next Generation. And uh, during this event, there were various uh, members from uh, the cast uh, from various different Star Wars uh, series. Star Trek. Star Trek. I'm sorry. So you got it's not all about Star Wars. Really? With you, it is. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek uh, series were there uh, in attendance uh, to, to wish him well. So very cool honor to, to be bestowed upon. So He is by far one of my favorite actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, if for no other reason than he can play any role that's put on a script in front of him. Mm-hmm. And he does it exceptionally well. That he's got a great voice, too. Oh, Gotta love characters with great voices. You know, and he's just so, you know, like, uh, there's just something about him. There, there, there's know? an authenticity to him yes. in every role that he does. Yes, and and just, you know, I follow him on social media, and, you know, he's, he's funny, but yet he's... You He's know, 79 years old. Yeah. I would not have guessed that. Yeah. And that's the thing is when you think, you know, back to, you know, 1987, you know, you know, yeah, now he's starting to look a little older, but for the most part, yeah. you know, he's, he's. I remember him back. First time I ever saw him perform, he was in Excalibur. Okay. Uh, and he was fantastic in that because he was made for the part. Too. Right. Right. So, but great actor, mm-hmm. great honors for him. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was all we had for entertainment news. Mm -hmm. We will come back with uh, our insightful picks of the week. And I bow to you, my dear, for first. Thank you. So my insightful pick, I'm actually kind of late to the party on on this one. Um, It is the psychological thriller called You. Um, It's a TV series. The first season... Called you. me? No, you. No, you? Okay. You. <laughs> That's very confusing. <laughs> so the first season is actually based on a 2014 novel uh, by Caroline Kneps, um, which follows Joe Goldberg, a New York bookstore manager and a serial killer who falls in love with a customer named Guinevere Beck and quickly develops an extreme toxic and a delusional uh, obsession with her. Uh, the first season basically follows Joe 
um, you know, through meeting Gwen and uh, she's an aspiring writer and becomes in, you know, and he basically becomes infatuated with her and to feed his toxic obsession, he uses social media and other technology to track her and basically remove obstacles that are in his way. Um, in the second season, uh, he actually moves from New York to Los Angeles to basically escape his past and basically finds a new um, interest and obviously kind of his old habits uh, come back where he, uh, you know, is obsessed. Uh, the series actually premiered on Lifetime on September 9th of 2018 uh, in the United States and then started streaming on Netflix internationally uh, December of 2018. So the series attracted a limited audience on Lifetime, but then obviously once it got to Netflix, you know, it had 43 million viewers. Um when the first season uh, had debuted. Uh, Lifetime had announced that it was renewed for a second season based on uh, the author's follow-up novel, Hidden Bodies, um, but ahead of... Um, I'm sorry, it, the second season was going to be based off of Hidden Bodies, and then in December of 2018, it was announced that the series would actually just move to Netflix and be a Netflix original. So even though Lifetime had said they were going to have the second season, it actually never went to Lifetime. It only has been streaming on uh, Netflix. So the second season actually uh, was released um, Christmas day plus one <laughs> December 26th of 2019 and then on January 14th of this year uh, the series was actually renewed for a third season which is going to be coming out sometime in 2021 so I'm still not even halfway through the the first season um, so obviously reading this I knew you know there were spoilers he's going to move to you know a new city but it's just it's so well done and it's so creepy and it's that, you know, like we were talking, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, horror movies and things like that. And that suspenseful thing. And it's definitely a suspenseful thing because you're like, oh, my God, is he going to. Oh, he just did that. I can't believe he just did that. Oh, my God. You know, and he even kind of talks through, you know, certain things that, you know, he doesn't want to do that, but he needs to do that you know, to kind of move things along, you know, in this relationship. So, you know, very, very well done, very creepy, you know, in some respects. But, you know, I'm looking forward to finishing this one and then moving on to the second season. Nice. Well, good pick. Thanks. So, unsurprisingly, my pick this week is a documentary. Actually, it's a travel log style documentary called Grand Tours of the Scottish Islands. I just finished it. Okay. Uh, four seasons. Um, very Are we booking well a trip or? I'd love to because it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. But um, <clears throat> Grand Tours of the Scottish Islands. Uh, in the show, uh, Paul Merton, a BBC TV personality, sets out to experience island life today, uncovering the past and its connections with the present, pointing to the surprising and the beautiful lying just offshore. This travelogue-style documentary series spans four seasons, totaling 24 episodes, exploring some of the more majestic of the nearly 250 islands off the coast of Scotland. The show offers a glimpse of the beauty that these remote and often hard-to-reach places offer. It delves into the history of the islands, interviews residents and former residents, and talks about the clearings that saw landlords displace residents in favor of turning the lands into farming and raising livestock for profit. Each episode explores multiple destinations and shows just how difficult life on these sometimes desolate stretches of rock in the middle of the ocean can be. Going back as far as Viking times nearly 1,500 years ago, all the way through to the middle of the 20th century, where little has changed in the way of life we get a glimpse at the rich history and pride of the Highland and Island people. Subtle details such as how one man built his own uh, man-made road by hand to keep up with the times, a traveling bank for remote villages, a postal system more reliant on water travel than land, and even a glimpse at geocaching on the islands 
brings out a clarity and insight that isn't often seen in other similar documentaries. Um, the one striking thing about the show, I think, was just the absolute beauty and variety of landscapes that you see from volcanic, you know, wastelands that you see in areas to beautiful pastures to uh, cliffs, uh, uh, shoreside cliffs to um, jagged mountain ranges. Um, you know, I, I was unaware of how many islands Scotland actually had and just the diversity that's that's on these islands. And you go back and you look at settlements that, that aren't there anymore and they talk about the history of them, the religious significance, the impact that the Vikings had on the naming of them. And some of these islands are so small that at low tide you can literally walk across the sandbank oh, to wow. get from island to island. Okay. Uh, it's a really, really cool show. Very well presented. Um, and you, you, each show shows different, you know, like three different destinations. And typically, you know, the host of the show, uh, Paul Merton, is walking from destination to destination. Oh, wow. That's how small these islands okay. are. Uh, but it's very well done. Cinematics are incredible. Uh, and the history aspect of it is, uh, is great as well. So all four seasons of the Grand Tours of the Scottish Islands are now streaming on Amazon Prime. Very cool. And we'll come back with some afterthoughts before we uh, sum it up. Mm-hmm. So before we get into the upcoming events that you wanted to talk about, I did want to offer a little quick little note. Um, one is... Uh, Monday, Prodigal Son returns. Yes, very so excited about that. That was one of our insightful picks of the week. And I also wanted to offer an apology to our viewers and our listeners. Unfortunately, last week, uh, in my haste to record the show, I neglected to do a sound check properly. And by the time I had finished the actual editing and publishing of the show, we turned out we had some sound issues on the final output of both the audio and the video, uh, which took me a day or so to correct. So thankfully, we do record the two sources here, and the primary audio source was clean. The video source was not. So I'm being far more diligent now moving forward with sound checks. That's it. You're fired. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to offer a quick apology for that. So what do we have to talk about? So same things that we uh, brought up last week, basically just a, a reminder. I figure we'll just kind of keep throwing it out there, you know, as it gets closer. Um, so the first one coming up, uh, which is one of our favorite, is ZoloCon. ZoloCon. I knew you were going to do that. Uh, that's February 8th and 9th. Um, in uh, Bucks County, um, and you will probably, there's a good chance, you might actually be going in cosplay. I may. I may be on site as a Sith Lord from the Star Wars The Old Republic game that I play. Now, more than likely, we usually tend to go on Sundays, so, you know, we, we are planning for uh, to be there on the 9th, and... You tried on your costume, you know, most of your parts, you have like, what, 99% of it? I'm just missing 90. the belt at this right. point. Right. So, looks very cool. So, he might be dressed up, just saying. Uh, so, that's coming up February 8th and 9th. Then, obviously, the great Philadelphia Comic Con. And why is it great? Because they, they said, said so. so. <laughs> um, that is felt. Fi uh, blah, 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 blah. That is at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center, and that is April third, fourth, and fifth. Um, and then a little bit further down the road in uh, August is the Keystone Comic Con, which is at the Philadelphia Convention Center. And I'm sure we'll have others coming up. As yep, know, we'll plug Wizard World though. Even though We're we won't probably be going. not going to be going unless 
they set some reasonable prices. <laughs> yeah, doubt it's happening. But. No, because we can get the you know three good shows out of the price of one. Right, Wizard and World Monster show. Mania, which is one that we That's we go to, and then you know we kind of take a couple years off, and then we go back and forth. That one I think is sometime in March, so probably next week I'll I'll put that one into the that list and of. The, the toy show at the Nerd Temple should be coming up again right, soon. Right, right, because that's usually the April, April Fools, Fools yep. one. So, yeah, we'll so throw that in, A lot of good too. stuff. It's convention season. Uh, ZoloCon is kicking it off first for us, like mm-hmm. it does every year now yep. that we're going to it. Yep. So, fun time of year for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's it. You know, if you want to reach out to us, you can get us on email at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. You can catch our videos on youtube.com slash insights into things. On the web at www.insightsintothings.com. On a side note there, I still haven't posted last week, so I'm really falling Slacker. behind. I was so totally flustered by the audio issue yeah, from last week. Anyway, you can get our audio podcast, which hopefully are all right this week, <laughs> at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. That is it. Another one in the books. All righty. Bye. Bye.